Well, hey everybody, it's Real on with Joe Mertland with Elimination Chamber just around the corner. I thought I would give you another ranking video. Every Elimination Chamber match ranked from worst to best end, let's be perfectly honest. The Elimination Chamber match has been, you know, has had its ups and downs the past few years. When it first started, I was really, really excited for it, basically combining war games and, you know, Hell in a Cell, this kind of stuff, a big old steel dome. <laughs> um... And, you know, four people in pods, two people start out, uh, one of the pods opens at random every five minutes. They get in, and by pinfall submission, or sometimes by knockout, or there's a way to write people off the store, out of the story or out of the match, they are taken out of the match. And I've actually always really enjoyed the matches by far. They can have a lot of really good drama. Some new champions can be crowned, some new feuds can be started, some old feuds can have a new layer added, or finally end. Really hard to tell, but honestly, by and large, there's been some pretty good ones, but... With any ranking video, you gotta start with the worst, so that's where we're going. And if I don't highlight every single of <coughs> every single moment of these 22 chamber matches, don't worry, I'm just gonna hit the highlights. So yeah, let's just go with it, ranking every single Elimination Chamber match from worst to best. Starting with number 22, this is the Extreme Elimination Chamber match from December to December 2006 with CM Punk, Test, RVD, Big Show, Lashley, and Hardcore Holly. Not Sabu, and nothing against Hardcore Holly, got nothing against the guy. But it should have been Sabu that was in there. And instead of crowning CM Punk as a new champion, or maybe even giving it back to RVD, no. They had Big Show as champion and gave it to Lashley. Punk and RVD were eliminated way too early. It was ridiculous. The crowd hated it. December to December is one of the worst WWE pay-per-views of all time. And Lashley winning it just highlighted how the ECW brand of, um, <coughs> by WWE rather, was totally dead, and it might as well have just been called WWE CW, or just been called something entirely different, because it wasn't extreme, except extremely bad. It did serve a purpose in pushing some young talent, but Lashley just wasn't ready, and this highlighted it. So yeah, and the fact that, oh yeah, every single guy had weapons with them, and they barely factored into the whole thing, that's how extreme it was. They gave him weapons, not putting weapons on the walls, or anything like that, and letting, you know, and maybe having them laying around or whatever, so people could use them. up. Nope, just give each person a weapon, and then it's, if it's like a table or whatever, once it's broken, that's pretty much it. It was a bad match. It was a really, really bad match, and the worst elimination chamber match of all time. Then we go to number 21, New Day versus The Ascension versus Lucha Dragons versus Los Matadors versus the Primetime Players versus Tyson Kidd and Cesaro for the tag titles. This was one of two chamber matches that was announced on a pay-per-view that was literally, I think, announced three weeks before. <coughs> I'm not kidding. I think it was originally supposed to just be a house show, and they decided, hey, we have a network. Let's just slot an Elimination Chamber thing in there because we didn't have one in, we, we didn't have one in, in February. We had Fastlane. So, hey, let's do this. And it was bad. It was really bad. Now, having tag teams in a Chamber match is not a bad idea per se, but this was taking teams that really had no business being there. <clears throat> I mean, I'm sorry. Ascension, Los Matadors, Lucha Dragons at that point. Yeah, Tyson Kidd and Cesaro or whatever. I mean, they were at least still a good team, primetime players. It was just, it was New Day, Tyson Kidd and Cesaro, and some scrubs. And Lucha Dragons were a good team. The bottom line is this didn't work. New Day ended up retaining uh, their tag titles, and then they would feud with primetime players afterwards. It was not very good. It was, it was in fact, really, really fucking bad. Like, and <clears throat> the action wasn't, the, the action just wasn't very interesting. It was very muted, and the fact that they just literally announced this, like, you know, a few weeks prior. There was almost no build to it. They tried to do some good build to it, and it just didn't work. Not falling the talents, just didn't work. Then we go to number 20, Ryback versus Dolph Ziggler versus King Barrett. Remember when he was King Barrett? <laughs> Mark Henry, R-Truth, and Sheamus for the IC title. Yeah, it wasn't very good. Danny Bryan had to relinquish the IC title due to injuries, which would ultimately spell the end of his career for at least a couple years um, in early 2016. I was at that show. Very sad moment. Very sad moment. Um, <clears throat> thankfully he was able to come back and wrestle, so great for him. Right back ended up winning the IC title, and it was, it, it was just not, it was just not very interesting. It just wasn't very good. No one really cared, and it wasn't that Ryback didn't try. It wasn't that the other guys didn't try, but it, this was just slightly better than the tag team match, but not by much. I mean, and Ryback had a very limp Intercontinental title run. I think he held it from here till, I want to say September, and then lost to Kevin Owens, and then that was about it. It was... Yeah, it was not very good. We then go to number 19. That is Braun versus Reigns versus Seth versus Miz versus Cena versus Elias for a universal title shot and Elimination Chamber last year. And let's be perfectly honest, this was the first year where they had a men's and women's chamber match. And don't worry, I'll get to the women's chamber match. It's ranked higher than this. 
the issue isn't necessarily the involvement of the participants. It's how they booked it. Because Braun pretty much smashed through everybody once he got in the chamber. And then it was obvious what was going to happen. Reigns ended up beating him and earned the Universal title shot. Now, there's nothing against Reigns. Again, all best wishes to Roman. Hope he completely recovers. It's against the character. This just was not very good. I mean, it... it kind of killed Braun deader than four o'clock. I mean, it really just did. It just absolutely just, it destroyed him. It, it, it did. Well, I mean, and what actually completely destroyed him was a bit later when they had the, um, when they had, you know, him team with a child to win the tag titles. That was at Mania 34. That was really bad. But yeah, this, this just wasn't very good. It was very obvious. They almost didn't even need a chamber match. And they had a great, you know, they had a great, like, gauntlet match where Seth Rollins lasted an hour and five minutes on Raw previously, and that was a much better match than this, and I didn't expect him to go, like, two hours in this, but still, the fact that, you know, Reigns won, okay, I mean, it was pretty obvious. I, I mean, I even remember saying in the predictions video, I don't remember a lot about my shows, but I remember saying this, why don't they just give it to Reigns? Because we knew what was going to happen. Predictability isn't always bad, but in this sense, the crowd really just didn't care. They just didn't give a shit. Honestly, they really, really did not give a fucking shit. And then we go to Triple H versus Goldberg versus Chris Jericho versus Kevin Nash versus Randy Orton versus Shawn Michaels at SummerSlam 2003. Had Goldberg won here, this might have been ranked a little higher. I've never been the biggest fan of Goldberg, but they should have given him the title at this point. Because it killed his push immediately. Even though he won the title a month later, it was not good. Now, Nash in there, it was what it was. He got beat and I think was pretty much written off TV after this to go film The Punisher. And then he didn't end up returning due to a neck injury and then was let go from his contract. And then showed up in Impact for a number of years. But anyway, when Goldberg got in and smashed through everybody and Triple H had that groin injury and got taken out <coughs> by Shawn Michaels, that was pretty cool. But, you know, Triple H is there laying in his pod and everything. Goldberg um, just smashes through everybody. I mean, he beats Shawn, beats Jericho, he beats... Um, Orton, he just smashes through them and everything. That was fine. But then Triple H, you know, gets the hit sledgehammer thing gets bro uh, brought in and Ric Flair helps him and Triple H hits Goldberg as he's doing the spear and then pins him and it just pretty much killed the match. Had Goldberg won, this actually probably would have been ranked in the top 10 at least, but it didn't. And not, you know, finishes don't always factor into why I rank them the way that I am, or why, why I rank them the way I did at least, but still... This was just not very good. It, it really, really wasn't. Now we're going to get to number 17. Cena versus Kofi versus Randy Orton versus Ted DiBiase Jr. versus Triple H versus Sheamus for the WWE title. And this one, Sheamus was WWE champion. It was at Elimination Chamber 2010. The reason this was ranked lower is they tried to recreate what they did with Cena and Edge about four years prior. The problem is they didn't necessarily have the spark and the interest like they did here. <laughs> um, Sheamus was WWE champion. Really wasn't working. Again, the title too damn soon. Even though it was shocking to see him as champion, it really did not end up fucking working. Um, yes, it, can, it you did have Orton and Teddy Biasi Jr. as like members of Legacy and stuff like that. And Triple H and Sheamus, which would build to their match that they would have in Mania 26. But And Kofi was in there, and Kofi was trying to get revenge on Orton for the whole stupid, stupid thing. Um, but Cena ended up winning, <coughs> holding the title um, for a little bit until Batista came in came in right after the match, and, you know, Vince McMahon declared him, you know, declared that he would get a shot right there, and then Batista beat him in, like, 30 seconds, and then lost the title to him at Mania, and then lost the rematch at Extreme Rules, and then lost the I Quit match at Over the Limit. Cena has a habit of burying a lot of people in, like, three straight pay-per-view matches, but to be fair, Batista, I think, was on the outs with the company, and had finally decided to quit, and I don't blame him, but he got one final title shot, so, or title run, so at least there's that. Then we go to... Number 16, which is for a WWE title shot from Elimination Chamber 2011, Cena versus CM Punk versus John Morrison versus R-Truth versus Randy Orton versus Sheamus. Besides Morrison doing his insane, you know, jump, like, from, from the cage, and you know what I'm talking about, jump, fall, whatever you want to call it, this is pretty pedestrian. I mean, you did have Punk and Orton, they were continuing their feud, Punk and Cena, like, you know, had a scrap and everything. Sheamus wanted revenge, <coughs> um... Since, you know, he had lost, he had lost, you know, the WWE title like the month or the year prior. But Cena ended up winning and I'm going to face the Miz and actually losing, but then winning the title at Extreme Rules 2011. Hooray! But yeah, besides Morrison's fall, there really wasn't much of note to this. Then, number 15, Orton versus Cesaro versus Christian versus Daniel Bryan versus Cena versus Sheamus. 
for the World WWE World Heavyweight Championship. That was such a mouthful from the 2014 Elimination Chamber, the sole Elimination Chamber match, and it was okay. It was a little bit better. It was nice to see Christian in Elimination Chamber. Daniel Bryan trying to go for the title. Cena and Orton continuing their rivalry. I think, like, fortunately, I think they're finally done with that shit. They should be. They ran that way into the ground. <clears throat> um, you had Sheamus in there. Cesaro, who should have gotten a better shot um, at the main event. But, yeah, in the end, Randy Orton ended up retaining his title. Was what it was. Wasn't bad. Wasn't great. It, it was a little better, but... There was one match that crowned a new champion that is just next, and that is from Elimination Chamber 2017. Dean Ambrose versus AJ Styles versus John Cena versus The Miz versus Bray Wyatt versus Baron Corbin for the WWE title. <laughs> Bray Wyatt was WWE champion. He won the WWE title on this night. I had to remind myself when he won it because that's how fucking pedestrian his title reign was. And that's so sad because I love Bray Wyatt as champion. But yeah, it was really, really annoying. Uh, really, really sad that his title reign was not booked all that well. Him winning it, though, is part of the reason why it is ranked right here, though, and not quite in, you know, the top, in the top, um, in, like, you know, the better half. Because Bray Wyatt winning was great. Him and AJ Styles being the last two, that was cool. But other than that, I mean, there really wasn't much to it. It was kind of, it was kind of pedestrian. Cena, you know, being champion for a couple of weeks and then losing it, it was what it was. And Bray winning was fine, but knowing the fallout and knowing how they kind of just threw it on Bray just to put it on Orton, eh, yeah, it happened. But anyway, we then go to number 13, which is Daniel Bryan versus Big Show versus Cody versus Great Khali versus Santino versus Wade Barrett for the world title at Elimination Chamber 2012. And yeah, this is a famous one where Daniel Bryan and Santino were the final two. And there were people who were like, they should have given it to Santino then be world champion. No. I mean, it's fine if you guys like Santino. I'm not knocking you, but that would have been a terrible idea. Great Khali also should have never been in an elimination chamber because he could barely fit in the pod, and the pod was a better bumper than he was. I mean, the pod actually could bend and move better than he could. And I get it. The guy's a freak of nature. The guy's beat up, um, <clears throat> guy's beat up, and the guy, like, you know, like, big old size and everything probably couldn't move all that well, but he shouldn't have been wrestling, even in 2012. Pretty goddamn bad, but Daniel Bryan managed to retain, so at least there's that. Yeah, it did have the fun moment of Santino and Daniel Bryan having a scrap at the end, and Santino almost won. Thankfully, he didn't. Or I might have ranked this as the second worst match ever, at least for Elimination Chamber. But anyway, then we go to number 12, and that is Jack Swagger versus Chris Jericho versus Daniel Bryan versus Kane versus Mark Henry versus Randy Orton for a World Heavyweight title shot at Elimination Chamber 2013. This is when Jack Swagger was gaining a renewed push. And they were trying to, you know, they gave him the whole real American thing with Zeb Coulter, and it was a good idea. And Swagger kind of fucked it all up with the DWI. That didn't necessarily work all that well. But, but, Jack Swagger winning is part of the reason why this is just under being, uh, you know, in the top, in like the top ten. Because if anybody else had won, you kind of would have wondered. Now, they did suddenly just strap the rocket to Swagger, and he probably would have been champion, even for the short term. But, yeah, it um, unfortunately didn't end up working out because of the reasons I just mentioned. However, not a bad chamber match, not great. But now we're going to get into <coughs> better territory. Where we're going to get into the top 11. So we're getting, okay, what, what's one that just qualifies as kind of average? And that is, to start off at number 11, Alexa versus Sasha versus Bailey versus Sonya Deville versus Mandy Rose versus Mickey James. The first ever women's elimination chamber match. And this is for the Raw Women's title. And it's from Elimination Chamber 2018, obviously. Not a bad match. It really wasn't. Bailey and Sasha finally coming to blows with their <clears throat> feud there. Sonya doing kind of well. Mandy getting eliminated first. Alexa being just, you know, um, the, conniving, the conniving bitch that she is. And managing to get the victory by being scrappy heel. And, you know, well, conniving heel, whatever you want to call. Sure, okay, Alexa winning might have, you know, turned some people sour. But, hey, at least I had the moment of Sasha and Bailey feuding. And that was pretty cool and everything. So, unfortunately, they didn't pull the trigger on that, but it was what it was. Not bad for a women's chamber match. All the women did very well. Um, it doesn't crack the top ten. It doesn't even it doesn't come close to cracking the top five. But still, for the first ever chamber match, for the women, and for the fact that the women all did pretty well here, I'm ranking it right in the middle. And then we go to number ten. Edge versus Big Show versus Drew McIntyre versus Kane versus Rey Mysterio versus Wade Barrett for the world title. 
for Elim Elimination Chamber 2011. Easy for me to say. <coughs> good match. Um, Edge managing to retain was good. Um, he got to really have a good showing here. Not that everybody necessarily had a bad showing. This is when I thought they might have had a little bit of investment in Drew, but they didn't. Um, <coughs> it wasn't. It wasn't bad. You, Edge had a lot of his old opponents here, like Ray's on again, off again, you know, rival and also friend. And Edge, you know, and Kane kind of, you know, blowing off the rest of their rivalry here. There was some good stuff, though. Yes, you did have the whole thing, the aftermath of Edge and Dolph Ziggler feuding over the title, <coughs> um, which wasn't necessarily all that good. Well, actually, I think that might have been right after the Rumble. But the whole point is, is Edge, the, the world title picture was kind of muddy at this point, but... Edge managing to go out as world champion and then going out of WrestleMania 27 a bit later as world champion was really, really nice. So, yeah, good showing by all. And then number nine, Triple H versus Jeff Hardy versus Shawn Michaels versus Chris Jericho versus Umaga versus JBL for a WWE title shot at No Way Out 2008. And, yeah, this was a this was a pretty good match. Not necessarily their best. I mean, you get you get JBL and you get Umaga in there. And I have a guest, folks. I'm gonna bring in. I'm gonna bring on my producer. He wanted to chime in and say something about. He wanted to chime in and say something about the chamber. He doesn't like the padding. But anyway, um, let's get back to the show. So yeah, the uh, the WWE title shot elimination chamber match. This was good. It was actually really fun. Um, JBL being included, I didn't necessarily care for. It wasn't the best idea in the world. Um, because JBL, by this point, let's be honest, really shouldn't have been wrestling. He shouldn't have come back. He wasn't really all that good. Um, <clears throat> he, had, he had some good performances, but it was mainly because others brought, you know, brought it out of him. Because his back was just totally wrecked and everything. He really couldn't do anything more. But Triple H managing to get the victory, pinning Jeff Hardy. It was the right call. It is, it is what should have happened. I mean, honestly... How can you say that Triple H shouldn't have, you know, won the match here? Yeah, it would have been cool to see Jeff Hardy win, but he was supposed to win money in the bank and then screwed that up. And folks, I'm going to take a second to rest my voice. I will pause this and be right back. All right, guys, apologies for that. Just had to take a quick break. My throat is a little bit dry. The dry weather is kind of affecting me. But anyway, let's get back to that. So, yes, left off at number nine. Triple H winning and getting the WWE uh, title shot was the right call. Now we get to number eight, Undertaker versus Batista versus MVP versus the Great Khali versus Finley versus Big Daddy V for a world title shot. And this is also for No Way Out 2008. Big Daddy V and uh, Khali were in a chamber match. Now... One, they should have never made Viscera shirtless. I'm sorry, they just shouldn't have. I didn't want to see Mabel, Viscera, whatever, shirtless. Um, <clears throat> but it is what it is. This, this was, the reason I'm ranking this a little bit above is the match was 100% better than I expected to be given who was involved. Now, yeah, you could take, I mean, having Batista in there, having MVP, having Finley in there was cool. Kali and Big Daddy B were just there as monsters for Undertaker to beat. And that is what ended up happening. It was what it was. There was this insane spot by MVP. That was a little bit scary, but good on him for doing that. It was it was a good match, though. <clears throat> and Undertaker gained the victory. Was the right call. And he goes on to face Edge for the world title at WrestleMania 24. And one of my favorite WrestleMania main events ever. And feel free to check that video out. I really did enjoy doing that one. And now we move on to number seven, which is Ed versus Edge versus Ray versus Chris Jericho versus Cena versus Mike Knox versus Kane. For the world title at No Way Out 2009, this was right after, or this was later in the night. No Way Out 2009, by the way, was in Seattle, and I did not go. I sort of kicked myself for not going, but at the same time, finances just were not going to be able to dictate where I could. But anyway, this was where, actually, it was going to be Kofi in there. Well, Kofi got taken out by Edge, and then he locked himself in one of the pods, <laughs> and you kind of knew what was going to happen. Earlier in the night, Edge had lost his WWE title by being pinned first in the WWE title elimination chamber match. So he figured, I'm going to get revenge and I'm going to do this. And he ended up winning the world title, uh, pinning Rey Mysterio, I believe. And that was good stuff. It was <coughs> a really nice match. Mike Knox, no offense, don't know why the hell he was in. I think he was just in there because they needed just another monster. And I think Kane was feuding with him at the time. Um, but yeah, that wasn't really necessary, but it was what it was. Edge winning, losing the WWE title, and then winning the world title both in the same night was really, really cool and a big moment and why this is ranked at number seven. <clears throat> and then we get to the match I was just talking about before. Triple H versus Undertaker versus Jeff Hardy versus Big Show versus Kozlov. Yes, Vladimir Kozlov was in the match. 
Vladimir Kozlov, by the way, in much better shape now, and I'm really happy the guy seems to be doing so well, because WWE really didn't use him that great. But Kozlov, and then Edge also, and it's for the WWE title. Jeff Hardy pinning Edge within like three minutes, Edge all shocked. Triple H and Undertaker end up being the final two. Triple H beat him, held the WWE title <coughs> for a couple months, including beating Randy Orton in a match at Mania 25 for the main event that was not all that good, but still a good match and set the tone for what Edge would end up becoming you know, even more unhinged, losing his title and then gaining the title in the previous match I just mentioned in the same night. And then we move on to number five, Chris Jericho versus CM Punk versus John Morrison versus Ray versus R-Truth versus Undertaker for the world title at Elimination Chamber 2010. And the main reason this is here, you might think this is ranked a little bit high, but it had its moments where like, <clears throat> you know, Undertaker was a world champion. Shawn Michaels had said he won another match with Undertaker and demanded another match. And whatever, well, how is he going to get it? Well, he ended up costing Undertaker the match, and Chris Jericho ended up winning. Uh, Sean coming up through the ring and stuff like that. Well, Sean must have been really, really tired being underneath the ring like that. But he managed to, um, cause, you know, interfere, cost the Undertaker the match. Jericho won the world title. Everybody else had a pretty good showing here. And Jericho walking out world champion while the Undertaker was protected. And we got Undertaker versus Sean at WrestleMania 26. Was the right call. Very, very good match. <coughs> and... Still, Jericho walking out as world champion was fantastic, even though he only held it for a couple months. Still really good. We go number four, Triple H versus Batista versus Chris Benoit versus Chris Jericho versus Edge versus Randy Orton. Shawn Michaels, a special guest referee um, at New Year's Revolution 2005. This is for the world title, and the idea was, okay, you know, Orton's no longer in evolution. Batista's kind of teasing, being upset with Triple H. Could Batista be the one? To, you know, could could he, you know, um, will he align with his, you know, stable, uh, evolution stable mate? Or, <coughs> or, will he end up turning on Triple H and doing what everybody wanted him to do? Now, granted, he did that a number of weeks later, but that's for another show for another day. This was really good, though. Sean is, is the referee. He was dealing with a knee injury. He could be the rep, and he could bump around a little, but he couldn't bump around a lot. And <coughs> it was good drama. Batista getting screwed over and everything, and Triple H beating them. It was what needed to happen and everything. And then they would eventually build a Triple H and Batista after Batista won the 2005 Rumble. Still some good drama. <clears throat> um, Edge being more unhinged and everything, and, you know, uh, being upset at Sean still for what happened a couple months before at uh, Taboo Tuesday. And that would actually lead to a match they would have at the Royal Rumble 2005, which was a really good match. And <coughs> Orton gain his possible title, you know, getting another title opportunity and then not working. And then getting another one at the Royal Rumble 2005. The bottom line is they kind of botched Randy Orton's face turn. They, they really, really did. Triple H Wayne and then building up that feud with Batista, right call for sure. Number three, and this one may surprise people with where it's ranked. CM Punk versus Chris Jericho versus Dolph Ziggler versus Kofi versus Miz versus R-Truth at uh, Elimination Chamber 2012 for the WWE title. And the reason is because it sparked the Chris Jericho CM Punk feud, which is one of my favorite feuds of all time. And yeah, it did have Miz and R-Truth fighting. <laughs> uh, Ziggler bumping around like crazy. Kofi doing some great stuff. Everybody really got an opportunity to shine here. It was really, really fun stuff. Um, and it just it just really worked. Of the, of the two 2012 Elimination Chamber matches, this actually worked the best. At least it did. At least it did in my personal opinion. I mean, some people may put the Daniel Bryan, you know, Santino, two finalists won here instead. And that's fine. But I personally enjoyed this one just a little bit more. <laughs> and yeah, CM Punk retaining and then facing Jericho, two subsequent pay-per-views. Definitely the right call. Now we get to number two, which is John Cena versus Chris Masters versus Carlito versus Kurt Angle versus Kane versus Shawn Michaels, New Year's Revolution 2006. The main reason I'm putting this one here is basically because you had Jer or you had you know everybody in there. You had Masters and Carlito as two of the final three. And it seemed like big things were in for him. Now, big things might have been in for Carlito. That might have been about it. <clears throat> um, he stayed around for a few years. Masters, eh, less so. He did have a second stint a little bit later on. But Cena ended up um, beating both of them. Or, you know, one got beat. And then, um, you know, Cena rolled up the other one. After, I believe, I believe he rolled up Carlito to win the match. Because Carlito screwed over Masters. And then Cena's all celebrating everything. The cage got raised. And then Edge cashed in his Money in the Bank, uh, you know, briefcase. And beat Cena soon after that. So yeah, I'm including those in on this. That's why this one's ranked number two. It also was a really, really good Elimination Chamber match. With the fact that, again, Masters and Carlito were two of the final three. That's pretty cool. 
And number one, what else could it be? Sean versus Triple H versus Booker T versus Kane versus RVD versus Jericho at the first ever Elimination Chamber at Survivor Series 2002. Almost said 2012 for some reason. This was really, really terrific. Triple H having to fight through that trachea injury. Um, you could argue maybe Booker got eliminated a little soon. RVD did get eliminated like maybe a little soon. Well, actually, no, RVD actually last. RVD got in some good moments. I mean, you could argue that maybe he should have been in the final, you know, he should have been in the final two, but you kind of got what happened. I will say this. I give shit to, a lot of shit to Triple H. A lot of people would have laid down after getting that trachea injury. He didn't. He, he, managed, he managed to power through it, and thankfully he survived. But Shawn Michaels, even with that, that horrible bob haircut and those shit brown tights, he managed to get the victory, and he got celebrated as world champion. It was a really good match, a little bloody, brutal, <laughs> looked like it hurt, probably did. But yeah, th that was a really, really good Elimination Chamber match, so that's where I'm finishing off this list. So thank you guys very much for uh, staying through all of this list. So let me know if there are other ones you would like me to talk about. And leave in the comments what your favorite and least favorite Elimination Chamber matches are. Agree, disagree with what I said. Like, share, subscribe. Twitter handle in the description. It's been Real Lossy with John Rithlin. I will see you soon.